The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. All right. Thanks for our AV, our AV team. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Deb Nicholson. I work at the Open Invention Network, but I also work on a couple of other different projects. Um, before I got involved in software, I did a lot of work to get candidates elected in Massachusetts. So uh, that's all about, oh yeah, that's fine. Um, that's all about herding the cats and getting volunteers to do what you want them to do. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is delegation skills for both volunteers and for paid staff. There are some places where that's a little bit different, but the general technique is the same. Um, how many folks are already like officially the boss at their like paid company? Um, keep your hand up if there's more than one person at your company. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> you can't delegate to yourself. That's a, that's a whole other meta problem. Um, and then how many folks are involved in a volunteer project where you constantly get asked, like, what should I do next? Okay, so that's, this is also going to help you with that delegation. So maybe you don't feel like a boss, but everyone has decided that you are the person who knows the things and has the keys to the castle and everything like that. And so you have this situation where you have an opportunity to get people to be more productive. Um, and so we're going to go over some do's and don'ts. So um, I find it helpful first to think about what kind of boss you want to be. So when you have the individual situations coming up, um, if you just kind of shoot from the hip, you might, find, you, know, you might find yourself thinking later like, huh, maybe that might not have been the best. So I try to think about not necessarily like what would Jesus do because he wasn't really well, maybe he was a boss. That's a different topic, but um, you know. But uh, but you know, what would what would the kind of boss I want to be do? And so, um, like, I don't think this is a good boss, right? Everyone remembers the X Files. He's very secretive. You're like, you get assignments from him. You don't know why. Also, like, you get the feeling that he's not like really on your team as far as wanting you to get promoted or even stay alive sometimes. So, like, that's a bad boss. <laughs> don't be this boss. Um, let's see, Liz Lemon, who, people watch 30 Rock a little bit, I'll give you a rundown. I also don't think she's a very good boss, even though she's a nice person. Like, so I might have her over for brunch, but I'm really glad I don't work for her. Because she's like super neurotic and like everything's last minute and super panicky. And uh, half the time she doesn't tell you why she needs you to do something. And then you find out it's because somebody else screwed up or whatever. And so the kind of buy-in she gets from her team is like, Oh, she's got another crazy idea. I'll ignore her until she comes in and yells really loud and is like has a meltdown. So that's not the greatest motivation in the world either. Um, if people watched Fringe, I don't know if you did. Uh, I think Burles is a great boss. He gives people like a little bit of leeway to make their own decisions, but he always has their back when the big boss is like, "What's happening?" And he's like, "Shh, they're a great team. You come to me first. Don't don't go, you know, bugging my team." So. Um, Think for yourself, like, what kind of a boss you want to be. And then that'll help you decide when you're like, I don't really know what to do in this situation. It's like, what would I do if I was giving people enough leeway and uh, trying to support and empower them rather than, you know, irritate them or have, like, a weird power play or, you know, whatever, whatever you call. We still never really knew what he was trying to do, right? So anyway, um, so delegation while very awesome and uh, will help you get to be a more effective manager or like co-volunteer is not magic. It's, um, I want to make sure that everyone understands that it's, it's not just like, I turned on the delegation and now our project goes to 11. Uh, it takes some work, right? And so we're going to get into what kind of work that is. So anyone who was like, oh, I thought we were going to learn magic words to make people do what we want them to, like sudo for you know, volunteers, that's not what we're going to do today. Um, or do, have people seen this, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? OK. So I think it's really good to think about what do your volunteers want. 
and, um, and that helps you understand what motivates them. So uh, self-actualization, I think when we're talking about coding or being involved in a project, this is really about giving people problems they want to solve, making sure that they feel fulfilled, um, that they get to solve new problems occasionally and not only the same old problems. And this is for paid and unpaid staff. People have options to go and get paid somewhere else usually. Um, it's, you know, it would be easy to only focus on that, but I think the other things are also important. Um, esteem, this is sort of feeling respected by your peers. So uh, consider for a minute the difference between introducing an intern as, uh, yeah, this is Justin, he's interning this summer. And this is Justin, he pulled out all those bugs that nobody wanted to deal with in RT. It must have taken him days, like hours and hours and hours, and nobody wanted to do it, and now it's done, and the project is so much better for it, Justin. So like, one is like, yeah, yeah, and the other lets them know that you think they are awesome in front of their peers. So it, and it, you might notice that it costs you nothing to spend a little extra time thanking someone thoroughly and specifically. So I think that that's, it's, it's like, it takes some time, but it's, it's cheap. <laughs> so uh, I think that's really important. Uh, another thing, uh, fostering social connections, things like that. When we had a lot of interns at one of the places, we would have them go out to lunch with us on Fridays and things like that. Um, encourage people to go to conferences, to make friends, like, oh, I heard you were gonna go visit Boston. You should check out someone else who's on the project that lives there while you're there. Uh, all of these kinds of things that help people to feel kind of more hooked in to your project and to like the culture and the community there are really good. Um, and I think an another piece that goes along with this is sort of like a sense of belonging. And so uh, when you have the option, you can give people titles as opposed to be like, oh yeah, so-and-so works on our project. But if you say, oh, they triage all the bugs or um, we consider them to be our graphic design manager or um, they're our press contact. So when you can sort of give people a title, uh, it really helps them feel like, ooh, I'm important. I'm the you know, grand poobah of something or other at your project. Um, and it just, it lets people know, like, I see what you're doing, and I want you to feel like you're in charge of that area um, as well. And so then you get folks, instead of, like, constantly, like, what should I do next? What should I do next? What should I do next? They're like, I'm the bug triager. I'm just going to go in there every week and triage the bugs, which is awesome, right? So, um, so the whole thing, you know, social connections, a sense of belonging. If you can foster that as a manager, you know, not, not getting too personal, but um, then that's really good. Uh, these things, uh, safety and uh, physiological, tend to apply more to in-person events like this. Like, you know, you wanna make sure that you don't have something maybe in the, like the wrong part of town when you have an event where people have to walk like 14 blocks and feel really skeeved out. Um, but it, it can also be a little bit um, making people feel secure. So you don't want to be the kind of boss that's like the surprise boss or like, you know, the ominous, like, we need to talk, come into my office first thing tomorrow. And then they're sweating all day, like, what did I do? What did I do? When you could have just said like, oh, it's, uh, you know, I just wanted to talk about uh, everyone setting up their vacations this year or whatever. And so being like the unnecessarily ominous boss makes people feel like their job security is, you know, not good. Or the wacky micromanager, you come in in the morning and they're sitting at your desk and they're like, I had some ideas about your work. And you're like, what the hell? Like, why are you at my desk? Don't be that person. Um, and then obviously the physiological stuff, when you do have events or if you have a physical office, um, you know, making sure that you have bathrooms for each gender and uh, vegan food for folks that want that, all of those kinds of things, really easy to take care of. If you feel like you're not doing it, ask someone else that you think is doing a good job and say like, can you give me like a checklist? I just don't know. Um, and so I think um, that's important. I also, uh, one last piece here with the physiological is encouraging people to work a normal number of hours and to take breaks um, just to kind of 
uh, you know, make sure that they get out of the crouch of keyboard, like, so that they don't go home like this. You want to make sure that they're, you know, occasionally able to do this. Um, and this is like, if you if you care for their physiological well-being, um, they'll care, they'll enjoy the experience of working with you or on your project. And so um, that's a little bit more for managers than for volunteers. Uh, but it is also for volunteers, you want to make sure that if you have volunteers that are, you know, doing that, like what happens isn't that they keep burning out, you know, for you, they leave. And then they leave with like a lot of stuff invested in their, their fingers on a lot of cookies. And so, you know, you want to say like, hey, wow, it's like you've been really working full tilt for a little bit. Um, I just want to check in and make sure that that's good for you. And if it's not, like, let's figure out a plan to help you delegate some of the stuff that you're doing. So, um, planning for delegation. So, um, I think, so this is like the culture of questions welcome. How do you, um, do folks feel like their project or their workplace is like a questions welcome? Maybe, most of the time, sometimes, certain questions. Okay. Um, so, I think you want people to ask questions before they're frustrated because um, if you make them wait until it's like, okay, uh, I've spent like three days on this and I still don't know what I'm doing, they're going to be really frustrated. They'll probably have created a giant mess that you have to help them, you know, back out of. And that isn't the best. When they could have asked you like a question like, oh, I, 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 I didn't seem to find this thing here, so I, like, I created it myself. I'm like, no. You want them to say, like, I couldn't find the thing or I didn't understand, like, what you wanted me to do. Does that make sense a little bit? Like, it's, um, the more often people ask questions, the less likely they are to go down the wrong path and do something completely unhelpful. And it's not, it's not their fault, like, because they just don't know. Like, you can't, you can't really replace ignorance with, uh, I'll just keep hitting my head against the wall until the wall falls. It, it just doesn't work that way most of the time. Um, I think uh, another thing that happens, oh, whoop, we'll go back to that, uh, that happens with uh, especially volunteer projects, people tend to get really tired of the 101 questions. And there's a few things that you can do about that. You can make it so that everyone in your, in your channel feels like they can answer the 101 questions, not just the project lead. Um, if uh, some of the questions are like super 101 and not specific to your project, but are more like programming language questions or distribution questions, things like that, then you can maintain a list of um, either internal or external advice. So like uh, making sure that folks know like, oh, if you don't understand Git, go over to OpenHatch. They have a training mission on how to use Git. And then you can do that on your own instead of having me, the project lead, walk you through Git and every other person that washes up on the shores of our project, because that could get really tiring. Um, so OpenHatch has a lot of great things like that. I assume folks are aware of Stack Overflow and Open Advice and Linux questions, those kinds of things. But maintaining those as a list and giving people a sense of like what kinds of questions they should look for in which places um, is going to help you not be always answering the 101 questions. So instead of being, you know, the person who answers the 101 question, like, oh, okay, good. You could be like, oh, yeah, actually, it's a really great resource online. Here's the link. Um, check it out. Let me know if you get stuck. But I, I, I think you'll find it's, it's pretty good. And then we'll talk after you, you know, have done that. So that's like, yay, like, you're good. You get to go back to work as opposed to, like, them knowing that they're asking you something that is super boring for you. So um, 101 questions, the, the more you can kind of make it so that those happen all the time, the better. Um, and a lot of times you uh, will have internal resources like that. So if you get the same kinds of 101 questions specific to your project or your workplace, then you can create an internal wiki and document that stuff, um, which we'll talk about now. All right, so um, let me see how we're doing on time. Great. Where do you guys think uh, the best time is to document? Like, this is your skill at the task over time. Here? Really? Yeah, I get a little no. Um, 
I think uh, what, what goes along with that over time is the, the, your level of interest. Yeah, you're learning new things. I'm awesome. We can't automate this already. Um, this is a bad time to document because you're like, I hate this thing. You know, so when you're here, this is too late. Um, this is OK, but not ideal. Uh, I think the best time to document was when you're starting and you document as you go. Because someone else who's starting at the very beginning when they look at your documentation is going to say, oh, yeah, uh, like I also didn't know like how you found the repository or how you, uh, you know, that we had a, an employee manual that covered a lot of this material already or something like that. So if you, if you document, start documenting up here and you'll change it. Like that's the great thing about computers. We're not um, doing our docs on a stone tablet so you can just keep revising them as you learn more and make sure that they continue to make sense. But yeah, this is like, eh. Like if, if you didn't document here, this is, this is still better than here. <laughs> But uh, the, 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 you know, what I'm trying to convey here is that the earlier you start documenting, the better your docs are going to be for people who are new to the task. Is everyone like, yes? Have you, has everyone ever read documentation where you're like, you felt like it was missing step one? Or maybe step one and two? Maybe steps one, two, three, and four? Yeah, OK. So you know that now you know why that is. It's because they documented over here. So, uh, so don't do that. OK, um, set great expectations. And when I say set great expectations, I don't mean make it sound more awesome than it's going to be. Sleep under the stars. If this motel does not have a roof, then fine. Let people know. But you can still put a positive spin on it, right? <laughs> so I, I, I don't know if anyone's ever stayed at a hotel like that. But um, I would rather just know, like, there will not be a roof. Uh, then find out when I get there that there isn't. And you should do the same things for your projects. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we tend to mistake, a, a common misstep when we bring volunteers in is that we forget to let them know how much time is likely to be involved in any given task. And people are going to vary, so you can give them a range. But if you're like, oh yeah, do this thing, and you know it's going to take like four to six hours, then, and, but they don't. An hour and a half in, they're going to be like, I am the stupidest. Oh my god. And I'm super embarrassed to go back in the channel, because it's like, it's been almost two hours, and I still have not even gotten very far on this. And like, <sighs> like people who are coming to do free work for you especially, and then they have the experience where they're like, god, I'm super stupid. They're not having a good time at your project. So make sure if you, you're like, it's going to be kind of a pain in the butt. It's going to take you a really long time. Um, the thing compiles like molasses. You know, all of those things. If you can let people know, then they're going to be like, four hours in, I'm almost done. I'm on the bottom edge of the range. Awesome. You know, so it's a little different kind of expectation. Um, I think. You know, also communicating the complexity of the task and the types of skills that will be involved. So if you kind of make sure you're checking in with folks, like, oh, did you say you're new to Java and coming from another programming language? Like, this is going to be, I mean, it uses a lot of really Java-specific stuff. So you're, you're probably going to be on Stack Overflow for hours, so like checking and making sure you're using the right kind of libraries and stuff. I just want you to know. Um, and if you're excited to learn Java, then this is a great task for you. Awesome. So, um, so making sure you can also kind of get the complexity to them. Um, if anyone else is going to be involved in the task, uh, you could let them know also. So if you know, you're assigning something where they're going to eventually bump up against someone else's work, it's much better for them to know in advance and for you to introduce them in advance than to have like, you know, that second person be like, we have an intern? What are they doing in my repo? Like, ah. So if you can make sure they know, like, oh, yeah, eventually you're going to get around to where you bump up against Sarah's work, and, um, and then you'll want to start checking in with her regularly. And, and I'm going to introduce you guys now rather than have it be like way later. And, you know, so, uh, so that's important. Um, 
I would also recommend talking about what they should do when they get bottlenecked. So you might give them like a one, two, three, especially if you're managing interns or volunteers uh, asynchronously, like in another time zone or something like that. So you might say like, all right, so step one, check our documentation. You know, and uh, then like step two, try it from scratch, run it again, whatever it is, whatever is appropriate for the task. Uh, step three might be uh, go and search on Stack Overflow and see if anyone else has hit the same bump. Um, and then step four is email me and uh, let me know as, w in, with as much like specificity as possible like what kind of bump in the road you hit. So, uh, so they have like sort of a plan and it's not like weird like, oh gosh, I got bottlenecked. No one else ever gets bottlenecked on this project. I'm sure everybody else is just flying at the speed of light. And it's like, no, 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 you'll eventually get bottlenecked and this is what you do when you get there. So this is all about managing the expectations and making sure like, yes, people screw up. Yes, there, there will be parts that will take a long time. And um, it also lets folks know that you respect their time that, so that they can budget it and figure out like, oh, do I actually have enough time to help your project in this way? And then they can give you a good kind of like, hmm, 10 hour task, like, well, that's gonna take me like six days to carve out that kind of time or two weeks or four weeks or something like that. So it's gonna help you, it's gonna help them, everyone's gonna be happier if they know what to expect. Um, so macro versus micro. Uh, has anyone actually done an internship in here? Yeah, okay. Um, and did, they, did you have the fun experience of like stuffing envelopes or something similarly tedious without having any sense of how that helped the overall company or organization? And you're like, yeah, I guess mail needs to go out. Like maybe they told you what was getting mailed, maybe they didn't. Um, but uh, you know, it's, or, and there are a lot of micro tasks. Like any kind of large endeavor includes a lot of micro tasks, but for motivating people, if you can tie the micro to the macro so that they understand, like, here's the overall structure, like, this helps us because, um, you know, so for mailings, it's like, this helps us because it's, it's fundraising, and then fundraising helps us bring money in, and then we can hire more developers, and maybe you at the end of the summer, and stuff like that. So it's, you know, it's, it's very important to let folks know. Another way that you might do that is to kind of, I would call this like sort of the Linus Torvalds slept here type of um, approach where you're like, I know like bug triage is really, really boring, but you know, fill in the blank awesome person in our community that everybody's heard of started there too. So they're kind of like, oh, I see. So this is like, I, I'm not given the, like, the, the side door to nothing and, and nowheresville. I'm give, this is, the, everyone comes in through this same like micro boring task door and then they get to like give a talk on the state of the programming language and stuff. So um, letting folks know that that's sort of, everyone came up that way or, or everyone starts somewhere and it's totally fine. Um, very important for motivation, especially if you're delegating something that's really boring. So um, everyone is convinced that that is a good idea, I hope. <laughs> um, I think another uh, mistake that often happens in here is uh, the micro tasks that we give to new people are not actually micro enough. So. Uh, we did uh, workshops in Boston for women and their friends to teach them Python, and we we're like, okay, we're gonna make the, the, you know, the first module of the workshop like a really small, like super, super easy thing. And the feedback we got immediately after that first one was like, yeah, that was really hard. And we're like, oh crap, it's too, it was still not micro enough. So we had to like keep going down. A lot of times um, when you're, if you, if you want new people to become involved in your software project, sometimes the micro tasks have to be too small to delegate, which it sounds irritating, it sounds like a lot of use of your time that you might rather spend on something else, but I would think of it as um, more like a, like a informal interview, like if folks have had like where you have to solve a problem in an interview. So think of some of your, like your super micro bite-sized newbie tasks as the interview, like 
Did you spend the time to get familiar with our code base enough to do this bug that's actually like super tiny and would have taken me a minute and a half to do? But like you did it, and so you demonstrated that you want to be here and you want to like do something on our project. So some of your micro tasks are like that. They really are super, super small. It's just like, if I give you a thing to do, did you go do it? Then you know, like it's like, then you know that when you're trying to delegate a larger task, you're not, hopefully, wasting your time because you've got someone who's like, yeah, I'm really excited about this. I really want to do this stuff. So uh, make your micro newbie like bite-sized first task like very, very, very small. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine um, uh, something that is too small for a brand new person who's not familiar with your code base, who's not familiar with the culture, who's not familiar with the inner workings of your software. So, um, the and, it, and it's some work to make those micro tasks, but it, I think it's very important. So, um, let's see. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's talk about it. So, this is. This is an important slide because um, a lot of times we forget to ask folks like how it's going for them, and then they go away and we don't know why. So um, it's, it's amazing the power of just asking people how it's working out for them. And uh, you can do these in any different kinds of ways. Like one of the things that we did uh, when I was doing political work, we called them one-on-ones. So like after someone did their first, like, oh, I went and knocked on doors or, or like stuffed envelopes or something for the candidate or, you know, something. And then you'd sit down and be like, yeah, so how'd it go? Did you enjoy it? Uh-huh. Was it um, was fun? This is not the time where you go through like, ah, I remember when I was new. Let me tell you my life story and a little bit of how awesome I am and maybe you'll be me one day. That's not the conversation. The conversation is like, hey, so are you, you know, like, are you a computer science student? Does this fit into your studies or is it more of a hobby or like, are you hoping to get work in this area someday? Um, you know, maybe you find out that like, uh, they're like, oh, I, what I really want to do is websites, and maybe the website for your project happens to suck. But if you don't ask, you don't find out. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's critical to find out, like, hey, so how, what, what brought you to our project? Not in a weird way, like, who told you to come? But, like, in a, like, hey, I'm really curious, like, um, how, can, how can I make sure that you're doing things that you find rewarding here for us? Because especially if you're having people do work for free, but I think it's important to ask your paid employees too because especially programmers have other options for work. So if they don't get the sense that you're like, yeah, if you are looking to learn more of some other language or you want to be more of a polyglot programmer or you, know, you want to be a project manager someday, then let's figure out like what tasks I can put on your plate to get you there. Now, if they say like, oh, I want your job where you sit around in the office all day and like, you know, screw around on Facebook and whatever else you do and get paid three times as much, then, you know, you, you can't really be like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I'll, I'll go down and stuff envelopes and you can sit in the corner office. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, you, can, you can find ways to, to do it. Like, and, uh, and that's a joke, but uh, if, um, if what they want is something you can't give them, then you can figure out a couple of other ways to get around that. Um, sometimes you can couple a really boring task with something that's a little bit more exciting um, and be like, OK, so we really, really need you to do this, but uh, maybe uh, you could work like 10 or 20 percent on this other thing. Or you could shadow someone else in addition to doing this boring thing. Or um, perhaps you, because we really need someone to do this thing that's like very low level, uh, if you could document it and then help us train up someone else to do this task, then that might free up that task and then we could find something else for you to do. So there's a couple of different ways if you're not able to say yes immediately, like you can skip right to the most exciting work we have here and work on that full time. Uh, so there's a couple of ways to kind of split the difference. Does that make sense to folks? And, and, and you, you know, if you've had good managers in the past, then maybe that's happened for you and, and it's been good. Um, let's see, how are we on time? Okay. 
for like a little bit more time. Um, so live delegating, I'm gonna have to do this over here, which will be interesting. But um, sometimes you end up with someone in your project that is uh, not good, like not like just not good at what they're doing, but like is irritating other people, is, is creating a toxic environment, and you might have tried to speak with them and been like, well, you know, if you could cool it on the like, weird, you know, whatever it is, like fill in the blank weird that's making other people uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, and the subtle approach has not worked. Or you're like, oh, maybe I'll just put you on another project by yourself so you don't have to piss off everyone else, you know. But uh, I, I think the direct approach is the best. And I am going to, we're going to do some live delegating now. Um, let's see. Where am I? Sorry. All right. Where is it? There we go. All right. All right. This is the part where I'm going to make you guys do some work. Can you guys read that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Give me an IRC, Nick. Like a nickname, anyone's nickname. Your nickname. Little What's it? Little Debbie. Little Debbie. All right. All right. Uh, a superlative. That's like, you know, like a adjective with brilliant. a brilliantest. All right. Excellent. Um, just for fun, we'll do a web service on this one. Twitter. Twitter. Okay. Uh, and then a profession. Any kind. Drink mixologist. Drink mixologist. Awesome. Uh, and then a number? We call that a blue <laughs> 42. 42. Excellent. A plural body part. That's a part of the body we have more than one of. Feet. OK. And then a bad project behavior. Okay, so, oh, and then, uh, oh, I, and then a negative emotion. Anger. Anger, okay. So this is the conversation you have with someone who is crushing your project with awfulness. Hi, little Debbie, I hope you can help me with something. As you know, we're trying to build the brilliantest Twitter for drink mixologists that the world has ever seen. We're planning to localize it for 42 new countries this month. Everyone is working their feet to the bone around here. So when you engage in trolling, it makes the other contributors feel anger, and that hurts the whole project. What do you think we should do about that? So um, that is uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully my, it doesn't have to be maybe quite that blunt, but um, I, do think, uh, I do think the honesty is really the best policy. If, if, like, if people don't understand why you're asking them to change their behavior, then they're not going to be very motivated to change their behavior. So, um, so while that is funny, but I think it is important if someone is, you know, making other people feel angry or unappreciated or just like assaulted or maybe unsafe on your project because of their behavior, then you have to let them know like, hey, you know, it's not you, it's everyone here is, is, is not okay with you. <laughs> so, um, and sometimes you really do have to let people go and just be like, you know, it just isn't working anymore. Like, I, you, might, you might be like the most amazing like Haskell programmer we have, but we'll just have to teach more people Haskell and, and, and see around. So, um, so that's, the, that's the presentation. I went a little quickly through there, but I wanted to make sure that we had time for questions. Um, these are, uh, obviously I don't hold the rights to the smoking man or any of that. But, um, and then I am ready to take questions from you about delegating. Yes? Yeah. Sure, Scottium? Totally. Oh, Captain, it's going to take you at least two days to do that. And then, like, a day later, they're like, awesome, I'm the smartest. Yeah, sure, Scottium a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, are you going to have like a copy of your PowerPoint available? 
Yeah, this, uh, it's impressed. It's up on uh, SlideShare. And uh, I'll, um, I'll do it again tagged with the self-title uh, slide. But I did this talk already at Linux Fest Northwest, so it's already on SlideShare. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it, or I can just send you the one I used. I, uh, mine is based on someone else's, because that's the whole open source way, right? Um, but yeah, and it's, uh, it's GPL. <laughs> I, um, I, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, so feel free to fork it. <laughs> actually, uh, it's funny, I think um, uh, Mad Libs is actually a really great first project to do when you're teaching children to program. Because it does something immediately, but it's actually you don't really have to grapple with too many difficult data types. So, um, you know, feel free to use this. Teach your kids to program. Other stuff, people, they're like, are you, are you guys all ready to delegate like a boss? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, my problem is outside of the store. Sure. sure. Mm. Uh, well, how do you phrase things to get people to step forward and volunteer? Uh, so there's a couple of different things. It sort of depends at which point you're phrasing things and uh, what, what your relationship is with the folks that you hope will step forward to volunteer. So um, if, you, if you have like a board of directors and you're like, none of my other board members do any work at all. They suck. But uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I still feel like honesty is the best policy. So once you have a mission statement and you're like, our mission is um, you know, to support uh, sculptors in our neighborhood. Um, and we're gonna, we want to do three different things to support sculptors. Like we want to um, do a fundraising drive to get tools, hold a little mixer, and um, publish an online database of sculptors for hire. And uh, so you got everybody like, that's what we want to do. And then it's like, OK. And then I would assign hours to all those tasks and then sort of say, it seems like as board members, we should all be putting in, you know, like maybe you have five board members. We should all be averaging about 20% of these hours. What do you guys think? So I would really just like, instead of be like, you, Justin, never do anything. Like, you, Molly, never do anything. Like, really say, like, these are our goals. This is what we want to accomplish. And there's, you know, X number of us, that divided, in, you know, means like we should each be putting in this number of hours. And if we can't, then we sh maybe we should be looking for new board members that can put in that time. So, uh, you know, does that kind of help you uh, figure out how to frame it? Or do you mean you don't have the group to come? Mm -hmm. They want things to occur, but they don't want to do anything where they don't get to ride their bike. Hmm. Yeah. It, it, it's a challenging population. Right. So I would say uh, one way to get people to do things that they don't want to do, and um, Twisted does this. They had uh, it's a it's a it's a project a software project. Um, I, I won't explain what Twisted is. It's kind of more dense than that. But uh, the upshot is that they had a lot of programmers who had been along, around for a while, and then like new people would come and do like it's a really hard project to get involved with because it's kind of complicated. And so new people would come and like submit a patch, and then they'd be like, wow, okay, and then they'd wait, and they'd wait and they'd wait, and no one would review their patch. And so they were having all these people that were like, I spent hours and hours for free to like work on your project, and then their patch wasn't getting reviewed. And then they were starting to feel like really sad, and then they would go away. So uh, they decided to um, put a, like, kind of like a, have you remember like the old school video games where you have like the top 10 performers on the screen when you crank it up? So they put like their top 10 uh, patch reviewers. So you got points for reviewing patches on their website and everyone knew who was the like rock star of patch reviewing. All of a sudden everyone is looking for patches to review because they're getting uh, attention and um, and recognition on the website. So they managed to incentivize this behavior that it isn't really that lengthy, but it does take away from the thing they would rather do, which is writing their own code, and then just made it like, 
here are like the most awesome people in our project and they're the ones that review patch like patches so if you can do something like that on your website um, I know for our other types of nonprofits uh, we've done like a volunteer of the month um, one nonprofit I worked at we did um, a volunteer for each we highlighted a volunteer for each newsletter and that was like six and then at the end of the year we had a little banquet for all of the six volunteers that we had highlighted throughout the year and it had them invite their friends which actually was really good fundraising wise too because their friends were like oh I didn't know about this thing that you were really invested in and I'm spending all this time and you know now that I know and I like you I'm gonna write them a hundred dollar check too and anyway so um, it, you really cannot highlight your volunteers enough and um, you know, make them jealous. Like, if you get like uh, in-kind donations, maybe you know someone that um, you know works at the. Maybe you can get that coffee shop like around the corner from wherever you guys meet to uh, give a, like a free free cup of coffee for the month to like your most honored volunteer or something like that. So like, really make doing the behavior that you want done like the coolest, where people are jealous, where they're like, "You've been paid for coffee all month." how did you get that? And it's like, yeah, I, I put in 50 hours of volunteer work for Bike Club. And then it's like, well, crap, I guess I better put a little hustle in it and put some more volunteer hours in. And, and, and make sure you only, you know, you're incentivizing the kinds of work that you really need done. Mm -hmm. So that's, figure, you'll have to tailor that, of course, but yeah. that's, that's the general idea. Yeah? I just want to offer an observation that um, in most of the places where I've had good bosses, and most of the volunteer organizations that have uh, functioned well, it's not, it hasn't been so much the people who delegate as a boss as much as the people who delegate as a peer that uh, oh. have been successful as far as instilling self-esteem and uh, uh, making people, um, uh, or, or ensuring that people are feeling uh, are fulfilled in what they're doing. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I might have to skip that, but yeah, part of the delegating is teaching other people to delegate. So then you're, you become the meta delegator and, uh, and, and constantly encouraging that like, oh, so if someone comes to you and says like, yeah, this is really, really time consuming, it's like, yeah, you should find someone to help you with that. So like constantly encouraging the um, delegating and uh, like downward. I mean, in a work environment, it's a little bit, you know, those are larger swaths. Right, it's still possible, and and like I said, so if you're if you're the boss or whatever, and then someone is doing something for you, like a combo of stuff, and then someone down here is like, I do the grunt work, and it's really boring, and it's like, oh, why don't you have them shadow you on something that you are ready to push off your plate, but is more exciting than the grunt work they're doing? So forming those relationships and encouraging people and saying like, this is great, I I really want you to. I want you to delegate this other task and then it's going to make this person's grunt work a little more exciting because they get to mix it up. And so. The more you, yeah, the more you can elevate everyone in the community, the more I know. the community is going to be. Yeah. I mean, how you end up grand emperor of the universe if you don't start delegating now. <laughs> um, all right. I think, uh, this, do I, are there any more questions? Everyone, all right. Now you guys really are ready to go out and delegate like a boss? Awesome. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Thanks very much. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. 
The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked.
Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks, in fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.